Frank Isola, David Dennis Jr., Courtney Cronin, Mina Kimes. College football week one. Back. Yes, it's back, and it's time for a way too early prediction. Yell at one team for the playoffs, yeah. not named Ohio State, Alabama, or Georgia. NC Utah. Ooh, that's a fun. Let's go. Courtney. I heard some fun names in there. Let, let's get Maryland. Let's put a pin in that. I'm gonna get back to that in a second. I heard NC State. Yeah. Rankings mean absolutely nothing week one. However, it does look cool when it says number five versus number two, number 11, number three. Let's start with Notre Dame, Ohio State to begin your year and your coaching career against this Ohio State team. Marcus Freeman, wow. The spread is 17. It seems like nobody thinks this is going to be even close. Frank Isola around the horn you. What do we have with Ohio State, Notre Dame week one? Yeah, Marcus Freeman and the Fighting Irish are walking into the Lions. And remember something yeah. about Ohio State. This is a team that last year lost the biggest game, regular season game in college football. That's Ohio State, Michigan. Then a team from their state made it to the playoffs, but it wasn't the Buckeyes. It was Cincinnati. So for me, there's no other team in college football that's got more to prove this season. And they have the offense, mm. the defense, the head coach to get the job done. David Dennis Jr. Yeah, first shout out to uh, Coach Freeman. The spread was 17 and a half at the beginning of the week. He said it was going to motivate them. Now it's just down to 17, <laughs> yeah. so shout out to them. Uh, this is going to be a blowout. Yeah. Take the points. Ohio State, this offense is going to be all-time great. Uh, I think they're going to put up 55 points. The question here is the defense. Ooh. That's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, Jim Knowles uh, came down from OK State. Uh, there were top three defense at OK State, so he's bringing that defense on. They gave up 30-plus points five times last season. So if their defense gets better, that's when it goes, what's going to determine how they do the So 55-14 or 55-31, it's going to be 55 for Ohio State, says Dennis. Courtney Cronin. Yeah, I'm with David with David on this one. I know Ohio State's going to put up a ton of points, but there's a level of mystery here with this defense with Jim Knowles because he's a first-time defensive coordinator at Ohio State, and this unit got absolutely manhandled when it played Utah, Oregon, Michigan last year, 34, 31st in points allowed. And Knowles seems pretty confident in this group. He said, I don't have any concerns. The cornerbacks are coming back, but we have yet to see them actually play in a game. So what do they look like? Can they – you know, beat expectations for what this group was last year because it didn't play very well last year. Mm -hmm. But you've got Ohio State. You've got them sizable. you got them big. you got them over the 17 points. I'll take the points. Yeah, okay. And Mina Kimes, now to you. Who cares about the defense when you have an <laughs> offense that is not just a well-oiled machine but a death star? Guys, uh -huh. let's not get cute here. Quarterback C.J. Stroud leading candidate for the Heisman, led all of college football in QBR last year. Jackson Smith and Jigba, their top wide receiver, led the Power Five in receiving yards. Travion Henderson, their leading running back, led the Big Ten in yards per carry. I mean, come on. The best case for Notre Dame, aside from low expectations, is the fact that they do have somewhat of an advantage in the trenches on their side of the ball. But there's just too much inexperience behind that offensive line to keep up with Ohio State's fight. Frank called Ohio State the team with the most to prove this year. Nick Saban's watching this at home, and he's like, all right, I'm going to use that. But mm -hmm. is, any, is anybody with Frank here, Ohio State, after the way last year played out, Mina, the most to prove this season? No, I, I think it's Clemson after that mm -hmm. season. Okay. I mean, those fans are much more distraught than a, a team that are fans of a team that won the Rose Bowl last year. I saw the last word. Well, also remember, they, they did lose to Michigan. But for Notre Dame, we know losing games in September and October don't necessarily kill you. So Notre Dame, keeping this close, their season's not going to be over this week. And it might feel like it because I think they are going to get blown out. But for Notre Dame, they have the most to gain. No, obviously, Ohio State has the most to lose. We move on. The champs, Georgia and Oregon in Atlanta, Georgia lost 15 players to the NFL draft. It will surprise nobody. They are restacked with blue chips. Oregon coach Dan Lanning to begin his career and year against the team he coached last year as D.C. to a championship. Maybe that's an advantage for him. David in Atlanta for the game in Atlanta. How should we see Georgia as defending champs, and how do you think they'll do this week against the 11th-ranked Ducks? 
Yeah, I mean, the city of Atlanta is, like, still, you know, super excited about the fact they won the national championship, as they should. But I think the feeling is the same as it was last year and all the years before. There's doubt that this team can beat Alabama once again. And so they're retooling mm. with all these players that they have. But I think, you know, they're still behind Alabama despite what happened. As far as this weekend, I, I, think it, I don't think it'll be the 17-point spread. I think it'll be a little bit closer. I think they're winning mostly because of the fact they have Bo Nix's number. He is 0-3 against those guys. One touchdown, mm. two interceptions, 56% completion. They just, they just know what to do with him. I think they're going to win this weekend. A lot of QBs have struggled against Georgia. Uh, last season, especially Courtney Cronin in this match. Matchup. Yeah, I feel like the defense for Georgia, like boo-hoo, uh, there's all this turnover, <laughs> yet this is a plug-and-play situation. Robert Beal is back for the Georgia Bulldogs, one of their best defensive linemen that they had last year. Six and a half sacks, five of those came in the final six games of the season. So they're in a situation where the offense has to put up a lot of points at first just so this unit can kind of figure out its identity. But, hey, this is what Alabama deals with literally every single year, coming off of a national championship. The expectations are high for them to do it again. Now Georgia gets to be in that territory. Mm -hmm. Mina Kimes? You know, I, I think it's reasonable to have a little bit of concern about this defense, given that they're only returning 18% of their production last year, which is the lowest number in college football. I mean, there are 14 players drafted. That's what happens. But I'll tell you this, Tony. While watching those 14 players ahead of the draft, I was constantly distracted by Jalen Carter, Georgia defensive tackle, who might have been the best player on that defense and returns this season. They've also got experience with Stetson Bennett coming back. I love this trio of tight ends. I think it's a very unique grouping that's going to create mismatches. So I'm not betting against Georgia, especially against Oregon team with Bo Nix. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think you didn't miss one Georgia draftee. I would never I would never step to you with the NFL draft and players, but I'm pretty sure it was 15. <laughs> Frank Isola, now to you. Yeah, it's that old motto, we don't rebuild, we reload, and that's exactly what Georgia is doing. But Courtney's right. Like, if you're Nick Saban, you're thinking to yourself, guess what, Georgia? Now you know what it's like to be Alabama. It's the first time you're coming off a national championship in 41 years. Everyone's going to be gunning for you. I think they catch a break. You're making Oregon travel all the way across country with a new coach, a prohibitive underdog. They Georgia will get up to a good start, but navigating your way through the varsity, which is what the SEC is, will not be easy, especially for <laughs> Okay, the number 11 team in the country, but that, that's the JV's a part of their schedule. So everybody's got a blowout here as well. Our two games, two top 15 matchups, two blowouts, according to this panel here. All right, way too early playoff picks. I asked you in the tease. And I wasn't sure if I was ready for this. Team's not named Ohio State, Alabama, Georgia. I heard NC State from you, Court. That's fun. Start there. Yeah, they were they returned 17 starters from a year ago. So the team that was nine and three, a couple plays away from making the ACC title game. I think they're going to be this year's Cincinnati for a number of reasons. And I mean, I, you know, Thayer Thomas, the receiver that they have along with Devin Carter and their quarterback reminds me a lot of Kenny Pickett. I think that he could be making that jump this year to be in that level. We're not talking about them that much yet, but the four touchdowns that he threw against Clemson in that upset last year uh, kind of introduced me to this NC State team. And I think that they will be in prime position to sneak up on us. So you like bit. that conference again, you know, or being focused on a conference like the ACC, where team can bubble up. Mina Kimes, you said Utah. Oh, I mentioned the Rose Bowl. Yeah. Yeah, I mentioned the Rose Bowl earlier uh, with Ohio State. I'm going to go with the team that went toe-to-toe -to -toe with them in that game, and that's Utah. I love this coaching staff held by Kyle Whittingham. I also love this quarterback, Cam Rising, who certainly lived up to his last name last year, going 9-2. and two. He's got that dual-threat ability. I think he's a smart decision-maker, and I think they're going to win the Pac-12. And if they win, by the way, this weekend could go undefeated. Mm, all right. Well, I've set the bar pretty high right there. So that's two selections for a fourth playoff team, kind of outside the box. Frank Isola, how about you? I mean, I forgot about the one team right in her backyard. She's right about the conference with the Pac-12 and Oregon would have a chance, certainly Utah. But how about USC? You want to talk about a team that knows how to, you know, build and, and bring talent in. That's a very underrated, dangerous team. They could be, as Courtney says, this year's season. Mm -hmm. And David Dennis Jr.? Everybody else sort of outside the box. I'm going to nestle myself right comfortably inside the box and go with Clemson, uh, which is sort of the paper pick. I like uh, them. Their defense is just as stout as it was uh, last year. 
I think uh, playing Notre Dame, playing South Carolina is going to help with their strength of schedule. And Dabo might make a midseason quarterback change, which last time he did that, it kind of worked out well for them. So I'm going Clemson. All right. Uh, you, so you already got – you're predicting a midseason quarterback straight change, though, for a team you're, you're going for the playoff. All right. All right. That's our, that's our college football way too early preview here. Mina Kime is in the lead, 17. Courtney Cronin, 14. Dennis Jr., Isola. Fire cell next. At least it's not a negative. The leaders right now after the Donovan Mitchell trade yesterday. Three All-Stars under the age of 26. And Evan Mobley, who a lot of people thought was Rookie of the Year last year. Wow. Frank Isola, what are you buying? What are you selling? Who won this trade? Who lost this trade? We're not going to know about Utah for a couple of years, but Danny Ainge is great at drafting, so I think it's going to work out for them. I love it for Cleveland. Even though you're undersized in the backcourt, you're pretty dynamic with Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell. And like you mentioned, you got those two big guys that block shots. As for the Knicks, the Knicks, for everything that I've told, made a more than fair and competitive offer. I think it was pretty close. And Danny Ainge, who still bleeds Celtic Green, probably said, I ain't trading this guy to the Knicks. I'm not oh, gonna... yeah? You think it was vindictive like that, that Danny Ainge wouldn't trade with the Knicks and not the Knicks? Dropping the ball here, which wouldn't be. No, the Knicks offered everything. Mm -hmm. I think that from everything that I heard, they offered whatever. You think they're the loser uh, of this for the trade? most part? They wanted. Yeah, because they wanted to get him and they made a good offer. David they Dennis Jr., how about you? I totally disagree. I think the Knicks actually kind of won this trade. Danny Ainge not accepting this, mm. this trade saved the Knicks from themselves, giving up Toppin and Barrett and three um, unrestricted draft picks. Uh, for a Donovan Mitchell, that was mortgaging their future for a guy who their team is constructed. If they add Mitchell, he was going to get them in the play-in tournament at best. Mm -hmm. Like, this okay. was not a championship move for the Knicks. They were going to give away too much, and they dodged a bullet. What do you think Mitchell does for a team that is playoff bound like Cleveland, David? I mean, I think it raises their ceiling down the line. They need to re-sign Mitchell because this is a championship team four or five years from now, and they need to get him re-signed after year Oh, you know, he has three. three more years on contract. Courtney Cronin, bring you in here. Yeah, I'm buying that Cleveland has the second-best backcourt in the East behind Atlanta, and that's probably not enough to beat the Cat, to beat uh, Milwaukee or Boston in a seven-game series, maybe not even Miami or Brooklyn, but they didn't make this move for right now. Darius Garland is 23 years old. Donovan Mitchell's going to turn 26 this month, and he still has three years remaining on this contract with a player option in there, too. Jared Allen's like 23 years old. Evan Mobley is 21. This group is, I think the floor for this group right now is the play-in tournament. They're not one of the best teams in the East just yet, but they're going to have time to let this core grow and get there. Over they were there season. last year in the play, and many are saying Lost this moves them forward. Mina Kimes, how do you see this trade for Cleveland? I see this as a rare win-win-win. Uh, the Jazz and Danny Ainge get their horde of draft picks and some fun young players. The Cavs get a player in Donovan Mitchell who actually fits in perfectly with that team mm -hmm. because they have the defense to compensate for his shortcomings. Right. And the Knicks, to me, avoid overpaying for a player that really only would have made them middling given what they would have gone up. The only loser I see is all of us because I don't know anyone who saw this coming. Mm -hmm. Buy or sell two, U.S. Open last night. Rob Sustained at Wimbledon. That's an injury that's going to take him six months to recover from. Yeah. Yesterday, after the match, he said he made it sound like he had a concussion after hitting himself in the face with his racket and then going down. 27 uh, unforced errors in his first two sets. That's not play that you typically expect from Rafa Nadal, but he was able to overcome it. I'm just worried about how this is going to affect him going forward at the U.S. Open because last time he had an injury, we saw him withdraw from Wimbledon. David Dennis Jr. Yeah, I think I think Nadal is going to win uh, his next match, 17-0 against Gasquet, who's not won a set against Nadal since 2008. So pencil him in for that. But I, I agree with Courtney. I think that abdominal injury is impacting him, especially at the beginning of these matches. I don't know if he needs to loosen up or something, but he's looking bad in these opening sets, and that he can't have slow starts once the competition gets. Frank, your takeaway from Nadal. Yeah, we talk so much about Nadal being a physical player and taking a pounding. Here's a case of him giving himself a pounding by hitting himself in the face with the racket. I just think for him, I always going to believe in him because he's a fighter up until the end. I just think it's a little bit too much for him, especially coming off of that significant injury he had in Wimbledon. I think he can get to the semifinal. I just don't believe he can win five more matches. Times. 
You know, this was a really strange match because it was like he flipped a switch halfway through, and that's why I believe in him because I don't think his struggles were physical. I think they were technical, and once he made the necessary adjustments, he looked like the doll of old. Mm -hmm. And now tonight, Serena Williams. Now, you know, having good time and playing with house money, this is about her winning. She can win this thing, in part because Tamjanovic, you mentioned, is ranked 46. Uh, her path to get back, to get to the final, is realistic. And if you don't love watching this, you don't have a heart. Right, but I'm, I'm happy to hear you say that, because yesterday's panel was impossibly respectful, I would say, in a good way, but of just, don't look ahead. Do not look ahead. Well, you can look, Frank Isola, you're enjoying this. Oh, absolutely. Serena's looking ahead, and I think what should never be discounted, and you've heard this after the first two matches, what the crowd in Arthur Ashe Stadium is like for the opposing player. That crowd, they won't even let the player serve, and it really, you really get unsettled. Only Maximus going into the Roman Coliseum and Gladiator is a tougher road win than it's going to be for the opponent for Serena. It is not, because everybody's doing this to you. Yeah. They want you to go uh, down in a, in, a, in a bad way. I mean, I did see Serena try to quiet down the crowd, but you're right about that. Exactly. David Dennis Jr. Yeah, I want to talk about yesterday's panel. There was so much doom and gloom, a bunch of Debbie Downers <laughs> acting like Serena got carted off the court or something. Like, can we have fun and celebrate what she's doing and the way that she is winning? She had 47 winners against Contivate. 73% of her points are, are, are coming off of her first serve. She's looking dominant and young, and we owe it to Serena and her legacy to believe that she can win instead of acting mm, like she should just we be We owe it to, to Serena. Okay, and Courtney Corona, how about you? Yeah, we owe it to Serena so much that we changed the U.S. Open when she's going to be playing tonight from ESPN2 to ESPN1. They moved college football off there, so all of the eyeballs are going to be on Serena on Friday night. And I feel like after she left, the after her second set uh, on Wednesday, she took a bathroom break. She comes back out looking like a 30-year-old playing tennis versus someone who's 40. She was absolutely dominant. Her movement skills make it so tough for her to defend. And I'm looking forward to seeing that again on Friday night. Mm -hmm. You got her winning, it sounds like, Courtney Cronin. I David do. Dennis Jr. celebrating the win. Mina Kimes, Frank Isola, everybody's got Serena winning tonight. Roll back the Oprah tribute. Let's do it again. <laughs> Get Gail <laughs> King out it there. Is, Let's go. It's amazing what happens after the matches. Mina Kimes, Frank Isola, that's our showdown next. West Virginia had an 85.8% win probability when they punted on fourth and one with six minutes left. Pitt said thank you for the ball, came back, Pitt won the game. That decision to punt versus this decision by the South Carolina State punter to not punt, but Freelance fake on fourth and 19, getting actually close to making it, but then Freelance again and punt way past the line of scrimmage, which of course is a penalty. Mina, least explicable special teams moment. Oh, well, the attempt at the, the fake was funnier, but I'm gonna go with West Virginia. Um, just because they absolutely screwed up an opportunity to pull up the upset, not just because of the time, but also because they were destroying Pittsburgh mm. on the ground. You can't tell me they wouldn't have been able to pick up that first mm -hmm. down. Frank? Yeah, but, but they still have a seven-point lead there, so I get it. They're being conservative first game of the season. I feel badly for the South Carolina State punter because he's running. His instincts are telling him, keep going. Something clicked. Oh, wait, that's right. They want me to punt the ball. All of a sudden, he stopped and punted it. <laughs> that's something we do in the schoolyard that you get away they with. They want you me to punt the ball. I think yeah. by naming him punter, that was a hint of what they wanted him to do. Hey, freelancing, <laughs> sometimes you, you lose track of where you are in the field. Totally inexplicable for that punt there. In the backyard brawl, gave away. That's in Tough loss to West Virginia. We'll move on. Fences. Purdue, Penn State last night was wild. Penn State won. If you find yourself queasy, look away uh, because something queasy is about to happen here. The Purdue pick six turned into a puke six. Chris Jefferson went 72 yards, lost his lunch. He said the second it happened, he knew he was going to be a meme. Frank, if you know it's going to make you puke after, do you still want the pick six? Come on, Tony. We, we still write poems about Michael Jordan being uh, sick and having a great game. Pete Sampras mm -hmm. did this at the U.S. Mm -hmm. Open. We bow down. There's nothing wrong with that. He got the job done. I like Gina? it. Yeah, I mean, Sean Clifford threw up a terrible pass. Chris Jefferson threw up, well, whatever he <laughs> ate that day. You got to give him credit not only for making an incredible play, but doing it in the fourth quarter. He was gassed. That's why he puked. Yeah. Mina Kimes, 30 seconds of FaceTime. Oh, oh, that's going to make me throw up. 
<laughs> oh, some distressing news. The Baltimore Ravens announced today that their mascot, Poe, is out for the season. After tearing his ACL at halftime, he will appear nevermore. They are, however, holding additions to see who will be the next next man up in the pecking order, uh, the new mascot. But I just wanted to give a shout out to Poe, even when he was being carted off the field. He kept a smile on his, uh, albeit painted mask. No feather in the cap for a pro's poe. Look at that. Oh, that the puns amazing. left and right. Unbelievable. Peter, huh? <laughs> David Dennis Jr., your last word. Yeah, my hometown, Jackson, Mississippi, 180,000 people without clean water, some without running water. Please uh, donate to, to get some bottles.